tales for dark nights. The following performance is a first round entry in the 2017 Evil Idol voice acting competition. Voting is simple. Following the performance, simply click the thumbs up icon on this video if you'd like them to become a member of the team, or the thumbs down if you'd rather they not. Voting on this entry will conclude one week after the date of its posting. Good luck to all of our contestants. He had directed, in great part, the movable embellishments of the Seven Chambers upon occasion of this great feat, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. There are much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has been seen since in Hernani. There are arabesque figures, within suited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. Two and fro in the seven chambers there stalked. In fact, a multitude of dreams, and these, the dreams, writhered in and about, taking cue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon, there strikes the ebony clock, which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then, for a moment, all is still, and all is silent save for the voice of the clock. The dreams are still frozen as they stand, but the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant, and a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again the music swells, and the dreams live, and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the makers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls, and to whom whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches the ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life, and the revel went whirringly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. Then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolution of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation in all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes we sounded by the bell of the clock, and thus it happened. Perhaps the more of thought crept, the more of time, into the meditation of thoughtful among those who reveled, and thus too, it happened. Perhaps that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure who had arrested the attention of no single individual before, and the rumor of this new presence had having spread itself whisperingly around. There arose at length from the whole company a buzz, a murmur, expressive of disapprobation and surprise, then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have exiled such sensation. In truth, the masquerade lights of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had out-heralded Harold and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords of the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion, even with the utterly lost to whom life and death are equally jests. There are matters of which no jests can be made. The whole company indeed seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet, all this might have been endured, if not approved by the mad revelers around, but the murmur had gone so far as to assume a type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow with all the features of the fate was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. New entries will be posted throughout July. Be sure to tune in and vote for each of them and help decide who becomes the next Evil Idol. In the meantime, turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights